This evening, we're continuing our overview of the Old Testament book titled Psalms. And with this as the goal, let's open our Bibles now to Psalms chapter 30. And as we make our way to the 30th chapter of Psalms, I just want to take a moment to point out that this psalm was written by King David. And while most of David's psalms include a superscription section that identifies his authorship, this psalm actually has a very unique superscription, which has caused some to question the actual occasion for which this song was written. As a matter of fact, it's there in the beginning of verse 1 where we read a psalm, a song at the dedication of the house of David. Now here in this superscription section of this psalm, we learn that, that the lyrics of this song were actually written for the dedication of a house. And if we take this at face value, then this was the dedication of, of the house of David. And while some scholars are cer- certain that this song was sung during the dedication of David's personal palace, others are convinced that David wrote this song to be sung during the dedication of the house of the Lord. Uh, One example of this can be found in the writings of Charles Spurgeon. He actually began his commentary on this chapter by writing this. He says, A psalm and song at the dedication of the house of David, or rather, a psalm, a song of dedication for the house by David. A song of faith since the house of Jehovah here intended, David never lived to see. In other words, uh, you know, Charles Spurgeon believed that David didn't write this song for the dedication of his own personal palace, but instead he wrote this song so that it could be sung during the dedication of the temple, the house of the Lord, which his son Solomon would build for the glory of God. Further proof that David wrote this psalm for the dedication of the temple, well, it can be found in the fact that this psalm was again sung during the first festival of Hanukkah in 165 BC when the Jews cleansed and rededicated the second temple after Antiochus Epiphanes defiled it. The chances are they chose this specific psalm because this song was more than likely sung at the dedication of the first temple. Well, regardless of whether this psalm was written for the dedication of the temple or for the dedication of David's personal palace, this song of praise helps us to realize that the difficulties that we may be enduring today ought not keep believers from becoming people of praise. And while I realize that there are times when we might not feel like singing the praises of the Lord, well, it's crucial for every Christian to remember that the troubles of today are temporary, and so so they shouldn't stop us from being people of praise. And I realize that the difficulties that we face today can be mentally overwhelming, even emotionally consuming, and yet we must always remember that the troubles of today are temporary. But the praiseworthiness of God is forever. The praiseworthiness of God is eternal. Therefore, rather than drowning in depression as we focus all of our attention on the temporary troubles that we're facing today, we'd all do well to follow in the footsteps of David by looking forward to the day when we'll sing the praises of our Savior there in the house of the Lord. Well, with this as the focus, let's turn our attention now to the lyrics that we find here in the 30th Psalm If you would look with me there, we'll begin reading at verse 1. Here we read a psalm, a song at the dedication of the house of David. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. O Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Now, here in the beginning of this psalm, we find King David. He's singing the praises of the Lord. And just to be clear, we must not fail to notice that the title, Lord, which is found here in verses 1, 2, and 3, that title, Lord, is actually written in all capital letters, which I'll remind you, this provides us with an indicator that David is actually invoking the name of the true and living Lord, which is based on the Hebrew letters YHWH or yod heh vav uh, which is sometimes pronounced Jehovah, uh, but more technically, I believe, is pronounced Yahweh. Well, it's for this reason that the scholars who created the Legacy Standard Bible, they render the Hebrew of these three verses in this way. I will exalt you, O Yahweh, for you have lifted me up and have not let my enemies be glad over me. O Yahweh, my God, 
I cried to you for help, and you healed me. O Yahweh, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You have kept me alive that I would not go down to the pit. I believe that this is a more accurate translation. And from this, we can see that King David was actually invoking the proper name of God. And he does this three times. In in verse 1, he says, O Yahweh. In in verse 2, he says, O Yahweh. In verse 3, he says, O Yahweh. He invokes the name of God three times. And while I don't see this as a proof text for the doctrine of the Trinity, I do think that the Holy Spirit was, in fact, leading David to sing the praises of the triune God who has revealed himself as holy, holy, holy. Now, just to be clear about this, it should be noted that we don't actually find the word Trinity in the Bible, and that is a go-to argument of those who reject the doctrine of the Trinity. They'll insist, we don't find the word Trinity in the doctrine. Or we don't, we don't find the word Trinity in the Bible, I should say. And, and yet, the, the, the fact is, we do find the doctrine in the Bible. It was actually in the third century when a church father named Tertullian coined the term Trinitus, or, or in other words, the, the, that's the Latin for Trinity. And, and he refers to the, the triunity uh, of the Godhead. He refers to the triune nature of Yahweh. And then later on, about 100 years later, in 325 AD, the church leaders confirmed the doctrine of the Trinity at the Council of Nicaea. And with that, we have to understand that the Council of Nicaea, they did not create the doctrine of the Trinity, but rather they confirmed the platforms of this doctrine that we find in the Bible. And and again, they did not create the doctrine of the Trinity, but rather they simply identified and codified what we find in the scriptures. As a matter of fact, there are three main pillars that support this doctrine that God is a triune being. The first pillar is based on all the Bible verses that assure us that there's only one God. And time would fail me to take you through all the different verses that tell us that the Lord is one and and, and there's only one God. And and so there's there's one God, and and so that's the first pillar. The second pillar, well, this is based on all the Bible verses that assure us that God has revealed himself as eternally existing in three persons, that being the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The third pillar is based on the Bible verse that help us to see that each person is fully God, equally divine, and, and equal, equal in glory and majesty, power, and rank. And, and I could just spend the, the rest of our time tonight just going from verse to verse to verse to verse to show you all these pillars, but I believe that there's one verse that really confirms all three of these pillars. We find this in Matthew chapter 28. It's verse 19 where the Lord Jesus declares, Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's one name that represents three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And according to this commission that Christ Jesus has given to every Christian, we see that there's one name that has the same authority representing these three persons of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So what is his name? This is, this is a question that I usually present to the Jehovah's Witnesses that come knocking on the door. I take them to this verse and I say, what is his name? What is the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And the answer is Yahweh. Now, you know, if you want to get real technical about this, <clears throat> the Son might be better... Uh, uh, referred to as the word, you know, so we have the father, the word, or in the Greek, the logos mentioned in John chapter one, and, and then the Holy Spirit. The logos is the son because the logos was placed into the womb of the Virgin Mary and she gave birth to God, the son or the son of God. So, so what we have here then is one God who's revealed himself as the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and that is Jesus. Now, we could spend the rest of the evening here trying to figure out how Yahweh eternally exists in three persons. Like uh, when we consider the baptism scene of Jesus Christ, we find the Son of God there being baptized Right? You hear the voice of the Father from the heaven saying, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. And then you have the Holy Spirit descending in the form of a dove uh, upon the Lord Jesus. And so we see the three persons uh, uh, of, of the Trinity in, in this uh, passage. And, and how does that work? How do you have one God who is here presenting himself as the Father speaking from heaven, the Son being baptized in water, the Holy Spirit taking on the form of a dove? How do we make sense of all of that? And, 
you know, three very important theological terms that I would point out to, to answer that question is, I don't know. I don't know how to figure that out. And, and listen, I'm, I'm happy that I can't figure this out. And the reason why is because, listen, if I could completely explain to you an infinite God, then he's probably not infinite, is he? If a finite mind can fully explain an infinite God, then chances are he's, he's not an infinite God, right? And we could spend the rest of the night here trying to investigate, you know, how a, a one God can present himself as three persons, all co-equal and co-eternal and these sorts of things. And, and at the end of the investigation, we're going to be forced to say, I don't know. And we have to be okay with that. At the same time, it's important to realize that the finite mind, which, will not, uh, which won't ever be able to fully grasp the inexhaustible infinitude of our creator, we can rejoice in still knowing that he's revealed to us what we can understand. He's revealed to us things that we ought to know about him. And so we ought to spend our time studying and learning more about this infinite God. And, and, and guess what? We get to spend the rest of eternity getting to know this infinite God that we will never exhaust. Isn't that incredible? Every believer, though, ought to embrace the triunity of Yahweh because this is what we find in the scriptures. And as we sing the praises of the one who has revealed himself as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, there's still that element of faith of just realizing that uh, we're just going to believe what God has revealed to us about himself, though we can't figure it fully out. And I believe that David provides us with an incredible example here in our text tonight of the way that we ought to sing the praises of God who has revealed himself as eternally triune and that we ought to sing his praises even when we don't understand why he allows us to go through difficult times. And with this as the focus, let's continue to consider the way that King David praised the one who saved him from his enemies. And I want to pick up our study of the 30th Psalm, beginning here at verse 4, he declares, sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name for his anger is but for a moment his favor is for life weeping may endure for a night but joy comes in the morning now in my prosperity I said I shall never be moved here in these verses we find David he's singing the praises of Yahweh and you know he, he's singing his praises after taking some time to contemplate the holy name of the Lord and as we consider the way that King David sang the praises of the Lord by remembering his holy name, well, I can't help but to think about the, the song that the four living creatures sing there before the throne of the Lord. You can study about these four living creatures in Revelation chapter 4, and they're always there before the throne of the Lord, and they're singing this song that we find in verse 8. Here we learn that they sing and cry out, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. He was, he is, and he is to come. He's infinitely existing. And from this, we can see these four living creatures there in heaven proclaiming the threefold holiness of the Lord as they praise his holy name. And again, this isn't a proof text to, to prove the Trinity, and yet we have plenty of texts that help us to see the doctrine of the Trinity, which then leads us to say, oh, this is a holy, holy, holy. This is a, a, a threefold praise of God's holiness, which helps us to understand that they're praising the holiness of the Father, the holiness of the Son, and the holiness of the Holy Spirit. In light of this example, we too ought to consider the holiness of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as we spend time singing the praises of the one whose name alone is worthy of this glory. His name alone. And I get it, you might wear, you know, the foot, football jersey of your favorite you know, athlete and have their name on the back of your jersey and think that's all cool. And I would just say there's only one name that, that I would wear on the back of my jersey, Yahweh. You know, the, his is the name that I would celebrate. His is the name that deserves this kind of glory. And, and if you're struggling to sing the praises of God because you're enduring some sort of time of trouble and trial, then I encourage you to follow in the footsteps of King David by taking the time to remember the holy name of our God. Take some time to, to contemplate the holy name of God. You might not know this, but the Bible is actually filled with many compound names that expound upon the character of Yahweh. For example... Uh, you know, uh, the Lord is referred to as Yahweh Nisi, which actually means the Lord is my banner. And this helps us to better understand the holiness of our God's name. 
There's Yahweh Ra'a, which means the Lord, my shepherd. There's Yahweh Rapha, which means the Lord that heals. Yahweh Shama'a, this means the Lord is there. Yahweh Tzidkenu, which means the Lord our righteousness. Yahweh Mkadesh means the Lord who sanctifies. Yahweh Jireh means the Lord is our provider. Yahweh Shalom means the Lord is our peace. And Yahweh Sabbath, this reminds us that the Lord is the, the God of hosts. The, the, he, he is the commander over all of the armies in heaven. Listen, if you'd like to learn more about the meaning of these names, then you might like to know that I actually taught a 14-week series on the names of God, which helps us to more fully grasp the holiness of God's name. You know, if you're struggling to sing the praises of the Lord, then chances are you need to spend some more time learning about him. And I, I encourage you, go check out this sermon series on our website. It's called The Names of God. And it's a series that will help you to sing the praises of the Lord as you learn more about his character and his nature and how holy his name actually is. Now with this as the goal, I want to consider how the holy name of the Lord helped King David to turn his sufferings into songs of praise. Notice again, beginning at verse 5, here he declares, For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. Here in these verses, we find King David, he's singing the praises of the one who saved him from the pit of despair. And while it's true that David had endured in a time of incredible trouble, you know, his enemies had surrounded him on every side. He had, you know, enemies both foreign and domestic. And yet in the midst of all of this, he also realized that the troubles of today are temporary. While the favor of God by which we're saved is eternal. The troubles we face today are temporary, but the favor of God lasts forever to those who receive it by faith. I like the way that the scholars who created the Bible in basic English render these verses. They put it like this. Make songs to the Lord, O you saints of his, and give praise to his holy name, for his wrath is only for a minute. In his grace, there is life. Weeping may be for a night, but joy comes in the morning. When things went well for me, I said, I will never be moved. Christian, listen, you know, it's possible that you find yourself tonight living in the the darkest days of your life. Maybe things are worse than they've ever been before. And if that's the case, then I encourage you to remember that the troubles of today will soon be replaced with the joy that every believer receives as we look forward to the finish line of faith. And, you know, a lot of times when we find ourselves in that dark pit and, and we see no way out, that we begin to focus on just the, the troubles and the trials and we begin to center our focus on everything that's wrong and, and then we just sink deeper and deeper and deeper into the pit. And it's for this reason that we have to look back to the holy name of God. He is our fixed point of reference and he is the source of our grace and, and he is the one who can provide us with the favor we need so that we can be lifted up out of the pit of despair. So if you want to stay depressed, keep focusing on the things that make you depressed. If you want to get lifted up out of the pit, focus on the Lord. Focus on the Lord. Begin to study more about his holy name and understand his his incredible character. And it won't be long before you're singing his praises. And as we begin to sing his praises, all of a sudden the things that are making us so depressed are no longer that big of a deal, are they? I like the way that Paul put it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It's here where he declares, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Rather than focusing on the temporary afflictions that trouble us today, let's instead fix our focus on the finish line of faith as we look forward to the day when we will enter into the eternal state of glory that the Lord has prepared for those who trust in him. Now to further grasp King David's perspective here, I want to consider the way that he praised the Lord for the incredible favor that he had received from God. And with that, let's pick up our study of the 30th Psalm, beginning at verse 7. Here David declares, Lord, by your favor, 
you have made my mountain stand strong. And you hid your face, and I was troubled. I cried out to you, O Lord, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. Here in these verses, we find King David. He's singing the praises of the one that, from whom he would received the favor and the grace by which he had been established on Mount Zion. I like the way that the scholars who created the Bible in basic English rendered the beginning of verse 7. They put it like this. Lord, by your grace, you have kept my mountain strong. It was the gracious favor of the Lord. That enabled David to escape the attacks of his enemies, both foreign and domestic. And it was the gracious favor of the Lord that empowered David to establish the kingdom of Israel from the city of David, which was there on Mount Zion. The Lord helped him to conquer Mount Zion. The Lord helped him to establish Mount Zion. This was all the Lord's work in the life of David. And David's saying, Lord, you're the one. You did it. The glory is yours. At the same time, he also realizes that it was the loving kindness of the Lord that brought David to repentance. To explain my point, we should take a moment to consider what David meant when he refers here to the way that the Lord hid his face from him. Let's consider the way that the scholars who created the New English translation render verse 7. They put it like this, O Lord, in your good favor you made me secure. Then you rejected me and I was terrified. That's right, the very minute David felt the displeasure of the Lord, his heart was filled with terror. The scholars who created the New Living Translation render verse 7 in this way, Your favor, O Lord, made me as secure as a mountain. Then you turned away from me, and I was shattered. In other words, David's heart was broken as he realized that he had disappointed the Lord. He had disappointed the Lord. And, and to put it in more modern term, terminology, he would, he would say this, that, that he was shook. You know, he was shook as he realized that he had disappointed the Lord. And I like the way that the scholars who created the Amplified Bible render verse 7. They put it like this. By your favor and grace, O Lord, you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was horrified. More simply put, King David was filled with fear as he realized that he had damaged his relationship with the Lord. And would it be to God that we would all be that sensitive to recognize when the Lord is displeased with a decision that we've made or with something that we have done? Would it be to God that we would all be sensitive to the Lord in this sort of way? You know, I think a, a lot of times we're so busy about life and everything that we've, you know, committed ourselves to that we don't really take a lot of time to check in with the Lord to find out whether we've done something that displeases him and we just go on about our day or maybe we know it in the moment but then we just forget about it as, as we harden our hearts. Would it be to God that we would become as sensitive as David was to recognize when the Lord is turning his face from us? And, and knowing that the Lord is quick to correct those that he loves, well, David quickly cried out to the Lord for mercy and forgiveness. With that, I want to take a closer look at the, the way David presented this prayer here in our text tonight. Notice again, beginning at verse 8, David declares, I cried out to you, O Lord, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? And then he cries out, hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. Here in these verses, we find David, he's crying out to the Lord with earnest humility. He's acknowledging that he had done wrong, and yet he's begging for mercy. He knew that he deserved the righteous judgment of the Lord, and yet he pleads with the Lord that he might receive the mercy that he needs so that he can continue singing the praises of the Lord and proclaiming the truth of our God. It's possible that you find yourself in a similar situation. You might feel like the Lord has turned away from you. You might be wondering if he's rejected you, if he's disqualified you. If this is something that concerns you, then I encourage you to consider what Paul wrote in Hebrews chapter 12. It's here where he declares, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. 
Listen, if you're living in sin without any sort of repentance and you're receiving no chastisement from the Lord, you ought to be pretty concerned about that because the Lord chastens those he loves. And the Lord has promised to chasten his adopted children. And, and remember, we're adopted by faith in Jesus Christ. At that moment, we become the adopted children of God. And you better believe that the father is a loving father who is ready to chasten his children. That being the case, you might like to know that it's the loving kindness of his merciful correction that provides us with the mercy that is new every morning. Please trust me when I tell you that the Lord is quick to receive those who have a broken heart and a contrite heart. So while, you know, he's ready to chasten us, he's also ready to forgive us. He's ready to correct us, but he's also ready to forgive us. And he's ready to receive those who have that broken and contrite heart. And so if you feel like the Lord has turned his back on you and you're wondering if he's disqualified you, then I encourage you to follow in the footsteps of King David by prayerfully asking the Lord for the merciful forgiveness that our Messiah pours out on the repentant. We should also follow King David's example as we receive the mercy of our Messiah by faith. And in order to make my case, let's consider the final section of this psalm. If you would look again, Psalm chapter 30, we'll pick up our study at verse 11. Here David declares, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Here in these verses we find King David, he's rejoicing and knowing that the mercy of the Lord had turned his mourning into dancing. It turned his weeping into dancing. And I'm sure we all realize that men look completely ridiculous when they dance. If you haven't figured that out by now, then I don't know what to tell you. Let's be honest, you know, there are some men who like to dance, like David and Alfonso Ribeiro. And, you know, there are some guys who, who think, you know, dancing is something to do, I guess. They say it takes all kinds. I disagree. I, I, I don't think it takes all kinds. But anyway, l- listen, the merciful forgiveness of the Lord well, is extended to those, even men who dance. And that's wonderful. Some people have, have asked if, ba- if Baptists can dance. And the answer is some can and some can't, right? So, but that's, that's another issue altogether. But listen, the merciful forgiveness of the Lord, uh, you know, it turned the mourning of David into dancing. He went from weeping to celebrating. He was rejoicing. You know, he was like a a football player in tights, you know, doing a little end zone dance, you know. It's cute. His merciful grace, the merciful grace of the Lord turned David's sackcloth into a covering of gladness. Isn't, Isn't that incredible? He was wearing sackcloth, which was a sign of mourning. And yet the merciful grace of God turned that sackcloth into a covering of gladness. And so listen, if you find yourself sitting in spiritual sackcloth and and you're just filled with sadness tonight, then I encourage you to prayerfully seek the merciful love of the Lord and then receive it. The Lord is extending it to you and so simply receive it by faith. And we receive this by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And listen, when we receive this merciful forgiveness that comes from the Lord, it it makes us want to dance. Guys don't do it, but it makes you feel that way. You know, like it, it makes you feel like just, I, I remember when I first received the grace of God, it's just like, I, I just had, it was like I was given brand new eyes. Everything just looked different. The grass seemed greener, you know, the sky seemed bluer. When we look at the world through the lens of our God's grace, it, it's, it, it just changes our perspective on everything. And with that, I just want to encourage you to realize that we don't need to spend the rest of our lives beating ourselves up about every single mistake we've ever made. And yet so many do. 
So many Christians, you know, uh, you know, we, we embrace the Lord Jesus Christ and, and we receive that free gift of forgiveness and then, and, and then we'll, we make a mistake. Oh man, can't get past that mistake. And we make another mistake. Next thing you know, you're just, you're just looking back on every single mistake you've ever made. Why would you do that to yourself? It's not necessary. Those who trust in the cross of Jesus Christ can rejoice in knowing that the sackcloth of our shame has been replaced with the robe of Christ's righteousness. This is what we call the imputation of righteousness. For those of you who grew up in the Catholic Church, you were taught about the infusion of Christ's righteousness. In other words, Every time you go to your sacraments, then a little bit more of his righteousness is infused into your account. And and hopefully you'll get enough of that at some point in time that that you can maybe feel comfortable that you won't have to spend too much time in purgatory. Nonsense. All of that is just theological nonsense. The scriptures assure us that when we place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he imputes his righteousness into our spiritual account. It's a done deal. We are covered with the wedding garment of his righteousness. And yeah, we made mistakes in the past. Chances are we'll make more tomorrow. But if we've received the imputation of Christ's righteousness, then he's already replaced the sackcloth of shame with the robe of righteousness. And so we don't have to continue beating ourselves up every single day over all the mistakes that we've made. And if that's the if that's you know, what you're caught in, if you find yourself in this pit of despair you know, because you just can't let go of the fact that you've made mistakes even as Christians, you've, you've sinned against the Lord at times and, and you just can't get your eyes off of that, that's all you can look at, I encourage you, get your eyes off yourself and get it back onto the holiness of God. We aren't Christians because we somehow worked out our own salvation, No. It's because we've placed our faith in the one who finished the work on the cross. And it's for this very reason that Paul says, forget about the things of the past and move forward. It's in Philippians chapter 3 where he declares, not that I have already attained or am already perfected. Paul's saying, I'm not perfect yet. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. Uh, And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Paul was a man who was quick to confess here that he hadn't yet achieved this state of sinless perfection. And yet he also didn't spend any of his time focusing on the failures of his past, beating himself up every day because of mistakes that he's already made. Why would, why would you do this to yourself? Like if you're one of those people who is just like, you can't you know, even think about dancing today because of everything wrong that you've done in your past, stop looking to the past. Stop keeping a record of your own wrongs because as far as God's concerned, he's already thrown it from the east as far as the east is to the west. We don't have to continue beating ourselves up like, you know, engaging in self... I always always say the word wrong, but... (laughs) Self... flatulations (laughs) flatulations <laughs> I did it on purpose that time we don't need to beat ourselves up over things that Jesus has already been punished for do you realize Jesus was punished for your sins so what does it help if you're punishing yourself too how is that helping anything Instead, let's fix our focus on the finish line of faith, continuing to press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And with this as our focus, we can sing the praises of God as we celebrate the holiness of his name. I'm 
In light of Paul's example, I encourage every Christian to forget those failures which are behind us. When you leave here tonight, if you're driving and, and, and you spend your time solely looking in the rear view mirror of the car as you drive forward, you're going to get into a wreck. You can't drive forward while just looking in the rear view mirror. You got to look forward. And spiritually speaking, that's how we move forward with Christ. We have to keep looking forward, reaching toward the things which are ahead as we walk by faith with Jesus Christ. And with this as the goal, let's become those believers who are singing the praises of our Savior as we continue looking forward to the day when we will finally and forever dwell in the house of the Lord.